Good afternoon, good morning to everyone joining our session. Um, I would like to welcome you all to today's session on climate change and human security, building integrated early warning systems to increase resilience in the Sahel. My name is Sophie von Lügen. I am a scientist and project coordinator at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, we are extremely delighted to have a great group of experts um, with a broad spectrum of background, backgrounds today with us, ranging from, from academia to policy and implementation, and with whom we will discuss today the role of early warning systems for increasing human security and resilience in the Sahel region. We will um, start our session with a short introductory presentation by my colleague Rahel Naudin after which the audience has the opportunity to already ask some questions. And then after that, we will start with our panel discussion, after again, the audience has the opportunity to ask some questions. And the audience, um, welcome to all of you. And we would like to make this a very interactive session. So we um, would like to invite you to ask many questions. Um, and you can do this in two ways. You can either during the Q&A session, raise your hand and then we will unmute you and you get the opportunity to directly ask your question in person. Or you can also already write questions in the chat during the presentation or the panel discussion, which, which we will then address in the designated Q&A sessions. Also, as a little disclaimer, the event will be recorded. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Rahel Laudin, who is a crop modeler and a postdoctoral researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in the Working Group Adaptation and Agricultural Systems, who will give us um, an introduction about early warning systems in the Sahel. Welcome, Rahel. Thank you very much, um, Sophie. Um, so let me share my screen. And I'd like to ask Alex to give me the right to share my screen. Ah, now I have it. Thanks. That was quick. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased that I can give um, this keynote presentation for the panel discussion today. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, my name is Rahil Audin. I'm a postdoc at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And in this presentation, I'd like to introduce the overall topic of early warning systems and how they can support food and human security in the Sahel region. And I'd also like to touch upon some of the concepts that will later on be discussed in the panel discussion. And I would like to show some findings of, of our own research, which is related to food availability forecasting. So let me start with the broader picture. Um, the Sahel region is highly vulnerable to climate change um, with mounting human security and development challenges. And on this map, I'd like to highlight some um, examples of recent developments in the region. This is not meant to provide um, a complete picture, but just to highlight some examples. Um, so Burkina Faso has experienced political instability in the past years, ongoing conflicts, um, terrorist threats, um, which led to severe consequences for food security and also to many people being displayed, displaced. Um, particularly the northern part of Burkina Faso is also projected to be confronted uh, with emergency levels in terms of food insecurity, as um, FUSENET, um, the famine early warning system network, projects uh, for the coming months. Um, then let's move further east. Um, we have right now severe floods all over Western Africa and Central Africa, uh, with Chad being um, severely impacted, um, even stronger impacted than in the last year's flood, um, which then also as a consequence has severe, um, yeah, leads to severe food security issues. And um, my last example is um, South Sudan. And also here we see um, floodings, atypical floodings after a long period of um, dry conditions. Um, and as you can also see on, on the map, um, FuseNet projects high levels of 
um, crisis or emergency levels all over the country in the coming months. Um, these examples, they, they highlight the very complex interplay of these diverse and unfortunately growing risks in the region. And these risks are related to climate change, to food insecurity, to conflicts, to violence, to displacement. And here I'd just like to um, mention some of the, the risks that interplay a little more. Um, so climate change plays a big role. Um, projections show that temperature is going to rise between 2 degrees Celsius to, um, to 4.3 Celsius by 2080, depending on the climate change scenario. Um, and projections for precipitation um, hint to rather at an increase in precipitation, but with a very uneven distribution. So we have certainty that um, extreme wet and dry periods will become more in future. So then there is a high level of food insecurity in the region. Um, many people depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. And that's also why adverse um, weather events and extreme events have a very direct impact on, on people and on their livelihoods. Um, there's a lot of competition for land, high pressure on land, which also is related to the steep increase in the population. And in general, we see very high levels of food insecurity. Um, and then we see many conflicts in the region um, with numbers of conflict fatalities increasing in the past years. And these conflicts show a strong relation also to climate change impacts. And they requ require strong transformative actions um, to target these um, complex and interconnected drivers. Um, so these enormous challenges, they require um, strong adaptation efforts. And therefore we have climate change projections um, they inform adaptation planning. Um, but in addition, we also need um, predictions of coming hazards of um, extreme weather events in the next days, weeks, um, or months. And, and they can support um, early warning systems. Um, so they enable us to anticipate these looming crises that might occur in the coming weeks or months. And, and they can buy time so that actors can um, already um, anticipate these crises um, before the disaster actually occurred. Um, and they support early warning systems. Um, and a comprehensive early warning system comprises of many components. Um, first, it needs a strong risk knowledge base. So we need systematic data collection um, we need disaster risk assessments. Then, um, of course, an, an important part is the forecast itself, so the forecast of a hazard, but not only the hazard, but also of potential consequences. Um, the results or the findings then also need to be disseminated and communicated in a way that relevant actors can act upon it. And um, moreover, we need also strong response capability so that um, actors are prepared to respond to the hazards. And later on in the panel, we will discuss um, how this can look in practice in Visa Health. Before we now move to the discussion, I'd like to present some examples of our own research, um, in particular of um, forecasts of food availability from staple crops. And here we show some examples of uh, Burkina Faso. Um, large parts of the population in Burkina Faso um, face food insecurity, more than half of the population. Um, and the forecast of crop production can help governments to anticipate um, these looming food crises. For example, food imports or exports can be adjusted or um, humanitarian support can be provided. Um, so early warning systems in this regard, they can potentially improve the food security situation of the people. Um, in our study, um, we now try to support these early warning systems by providing um, a, fo um, a forecast of uh, food shortages from staple crops. Um, and here we used a statistical uh, weather-driven um, crop model. Um, and in the first step, we provided um, a yield forecast one month before the harvest for these um, three staple crops, for maize, for sorghum, and for millet. millet. Um, and we combine this forecast of yield anomalies um, with a forecast of um, harvest area. And combining this, these two information gives us a production forecast because production is a function of yield and area. And what we see is that we get highly accurate production forecasts. 
if we include information on harvest areas. And I think that has high potential in practice because it means that if we get this information within the growing season, um, for example, through farmer surveys or satellite imagery, we could get highly accurate production forecasts, which then can support governments in anticipating a potential food crisis in case there are food shortages. In the next step, we then compared the historic demand for these um, staple crops with how much is produced. So in the greenish band, you see the historic demand um, expressed in calories. And um, in the lines, you see how much is produced um, for different cases, uh, one being the observed data and then our model results. Um, and what we see is that interestingly, for most years, there are more produced calories um, than actually demanded or uh, compared to the historic, uh, historic demand. Um, so there's a surplus of produced calories. At the same time, we know that there's a very high level of food insecurity in Burkina Faso. Um, and I think that that quite interestingly highlights how complex um, food security is. So it's not only about how much food is produced. What matters a lot is how people have access to food and how this food is distributed within the season, um, within the, the, the country, within the population, um, and also how um, stable political the political situation is. So do people really have access and is there enough stability to support a supply of food, for example? Um, and all this has to be taken into consideration for uh, food um, insecurity forecasts. And I'm sure later on in the discussion, we will have the chance to also discuss about this complex interplay of factors that all contribute to food insecurity and that has high implications also on how you have to design early warning systems. But before we move to the discussion, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce um, that there will be a, a new report uh, released soon. It's called a Moving from Reaction to Action, Anticipating Risk Hotspots in the Sahel. Um, and the report um, brought together various leading organizations and actors, um, including our panelists, um, involved in predictive modeling. Um, and um, the, the objective was to support the UN integrated strategy for the Sahel, um, and it was facilitated by UNHCR. Thank you. Super, thank you, Rahel, for this very interesting presentation. I would now like to give the audience the opportunity to ask some questions. There's two ways to do that. Um, in case you've missed it earlier, you can type it into the chat function of Zoom, or you can now raise your hand and I will unmute you. We have already one question in the chat um, by Alessandra Vasselli. Thank you so much. Um, which is asking Rahel if you could elaborate a bit on the direct relation of climate change and insecurity and what are the identified patterns in the Sahel. This is for sure something that we'll discuss in more detail in the panel, um, but Rahel, would you like to reply to this or should we discuss it later? Yeah, I think that's an, a very relevant um, question and I'm sure we will discuss this later on in the discussion because there are many links on how climate change actually influences human security. And one would be through food insecurity, but there are many other links. Um, and actually, um, it's true, I would like to give this question maybe to Barbora, who's uh, one of our panelists, uh, because she's really an expert um, doing research on, on human security, also related to migration. And I think uh, she's much more suited to answer this question. Yeah, thanks, Rahel. Um, Barbara, I'll hand you over the question in a, in a bit when we go into the panel. Are there any other questions from the audience? I think then we will actually move to the panel directly so we can dig deep into these very interesting questions that we've just raised. Um, thanks again, Rahel. So over to the panel discussion, but before we go into the panel discussion, of course, I would um, shortly like to introduce our great group of panelists that we have here with us today. I'm extremely happy that we got such a good group together. And um, I would like to start 
welcoming um, Andrew Harper. Hi, Andrew. Um, he is the special advisor for climate action to the High Commissioner of um, High Commissioner for Refugees. And at UNHCR, he is responsible for providing strategic guidance, oversight, and expertise to shape UNHCR's response to the climate emergency. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks. <clears throat> Great to be here. Then also with us um, as part of the UN family, we have Olo Sib, who is the regional head of research assessment and monitoring at the regional bureau of the World Food Programme in Dakar. He oversees the analytical functions of um, the bureau and which includes needs assessments and monitoring as well as the development of innovative systems, technologies, processes and products. Welcome, Olo. Then representing academia and research, we have with us Dr. Barbora Sedova, who is leading the Future Lab Security, Ethnic Conflicts and Migration at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And in, in her research, she focuses on mechanisms and contextual effects of climate impacts on human immobility and mobility and risk of conflict. So um, we'll dive into that later. Welcome, Barbora. Also with us from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research is Professor Christoph Gornot, who is an agricultural scientist, leader of the working group Adaptation and Agricultural Systems. And he is also chair of the Department of Agroecosystem Analysis and Modeling at the University of Kassel. Welcome, Christoph. And last but not least, we have Professor Chris Funk with us, who is the director of the Climate Hazard Center at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he works with collaborators to develop data sets, forecasts, and interdisciplinary early warning systems. Welcome, Chris, who is here very early with us. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everybody. Super. Um, then I would like to start, and I already see uh, many questions being asked in the chat function, which is great. So I would just like to remind the audience again that you can always ask questions even during the panel discussion, which we will then discuss later in the designated Q&A session, or you hold on to your question and you, during the Q&A sessions, can just unmute yourself or re-unmute yourself, and you can ask it directly to the panelists. So, um, Without further ado, we will dive into the panel discussion. And um, with all of you um, panelists here having worked extensively on the topic um, in the Sahel, I would like to start the discussion with the question of yeah, how climate change is already impacting human security in the Sahel, and also directly pick up on the question that we've gotten from the audience. Um, so Barbora, maybe you could start by giving some insights into your research on how climate change is, is impacting human security in general and particularly in the Sahel region. Sure. Uh, yeah, first of all, let me uh, say good afternoon, everyone, and um, many thanks for inviting me to this great panel. So it's a great honor. And maybe um, the best way to start my answer would be to refer to the findings from the recently published uh, IPCC report which uh, states with uh, medium uh, confidence that climate variability and extremes um, are linked to increased prevalence of conflict. Um, so there is a positive link. Um, however, in comparison to, to other socioeconomic and political factors, this link is rather weak. But what is important to keep in mind is that climate change and climate risks um, also exacerbate um, these other um, drivers of conflict. So um, including uh, food insecurity, water insecurity, livelihood insecurity, inequality, competition over scarce resources, and furthermore. And um, therefore, um, through these pathways, um, climate risks um, have the ability to contribute to conflict in circumstances um, in specific cir circumstances, for example, in, um, under the conditions when the institutions um, are weak or um, the governance is weak, uh, and so on. Um, the most vulnerable um, ones, uh, so states or segments of populations, um, are the ones that um, 
that are hit the hardest by climate change and climate related security risks. Um, for example, there is a um, recently published paper, which we will also uh, discuss a little bit in our session tomorrow, um, called um, Climate Endgame, uh, which uh, shows that under medium uh, and medium to high scenario of emissions and um, population growth um, by 2070, mean annual temperature of thir uh, 30 degrees Celsius and more are projected to affect primarily the poorest countries of the world, um, including large areas in the Sahel. So um, these temperatures are actually not suitable for human life. So the question uh, that emerges is, uh, where will these people go? Um, so Rahel already um, uh, touched upon uh, how uh, Sahel is affected uh, by climate change. So um, let me uh, let me um, speak a little bit more specifically about climate security, where Sahel is um, at uh, particular risks uh, risk for several reasons. So first. Um, it is uh, particularly strongly affected by climate change, as we have heard. Second, um, it is a region that is already affected by conflicts, including farmer herder conflicts, um, as well as uh, presence of terrorist groups such as Boko Haram in Nigeria. And third, um, it is a region with uh, weak governance and therefore with limited institutional capacities to address um, both cl climate related, but also peace and security risks. And um, climate change will, as we have heard, um, add another uh, stress um, or additional stress in the future. Um, it already adds stress now, and this distress will increase depending on the, on the um, emission scenario. Um, but what we can say is that um, temperature, temperatures will increase, extreme events will become uh, more intense, uh, water availability will um, decrease, uh, also especially in connection with uh, uh, population uh, increases, and also we will face um, decrease in, in, in crop yields, um, in specific crop yields such as maize and sorghum and what is essential in this direction uh, or in this context is uh, that uh, you know like if populations uh, fail um, to to adjust to these uh, to these pressures um, then then there will be uh, there will be an increased potential for for conflict uh, as, as they will be uh, exposed to more insecurity in, in all sorts of direction and maybe uh, just to conclude uh, one um, uh, thing that I would like to mention um, is that uh, as a part of the weathering risk project that we are currently um, leading together with Adelphi um, and uh, funded by the German uh, Federal Foreign Office, we have recently published um, a quite comprehensive assessment of climate security risks in Mali, um, where we also find uh, evidence of these dynamics. So um, if you want to zoom in this uh, particular context, then you the, the the study is freely available on our website. Thank you, Barbara, for this uh, great insight. Um, Andrew, I know that you extensively work in the region and that you also um, do many trips to some key risk hotspots. So it would be great to hear from your work, how you see climate change or climate risks already impacting human security in the Sahel. <clears throat> Thanks, Sophie, and, and um, hi to all the, the rest of the team of the Sahel uh, project. It's good to see um, uh, Chris and uh, and Chris and, uh, and Sophie and everyone else. Um, I, I think we're, we're very much in trouble. And I think this is what the report is uh, is coming out in terms of the Sahel, and and I'm also looking at the the questions which are coming up in the um, in the chat, um, talking about how are the um, how is the almost the multifunctional assessments working together? Um, what is the the capacity of of the region to be coming up with these assessments? Uh, the interplay between climate change and environmental degradation and biodiversity, it's all linked, and I think. Um, when you do go to the field, 
and you go to the borders between like whether it be with northern Nigeria or Chad or Mauritania or Burkina Faso, you just realize look, it's not just the, the question about this causal relationship. It's it's we've got to now sort of move beyond the findings of the res- these reports and say, okay, what the hell do we do? <laughs> because we've got tens of millions of people who are suffering. So this whole hu- issue of human security is it's not about the future. We're anticipating and we're predicting it's going to get much worse. But the lack of action at this point guarantees it's going to get much worse. And so you've got this position of many states are sort of saying, um, we will provide food support, but we won't provide support for adaptation. We'll provide uh, humanitarian support and maybe some um, security support, but we won't do anything in terms of governance. Well, what we have to be looking at is the interplay and interlinkages um, about what is what is occurring in a place like the Sahel. Mali is, for all intensive purposes, lost. Uh, Burkina Faso is like, wh- where do we where do we draw that back? Um, We've got many countries which are looking to try and ring fence certain parts of the Sahel. And so th- this whole issue of human security needs to be very much not just a humanitarian response and a food sort of like, let's dump in food support from WFP. Like it's a, it's a governance issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a biodiversity issue. It's an education issue. It's a, it's a human dignity issue. So um, when we do go there and this is so important for us because when we talk on the refugee front, which is what UNHCR is responsible for, 90% of the world's refugees originate from countries which are being impacted or have got the least capacity to adapt. So that relationship is always is already there. How, how direct it is, that's where the question is because people sort of say climate change conflict. No, that's almost a get out of jail free card for many governments who are not investing enough in terms of governments or the institutions um, or not allowing food to get to different areas um, under their under their control. So we need to be looking at all these areas and seeing how is it that climate change is going to aggravate existing grievances or weaknesses. And we need to be addressing those weaknesses um, in a way which is human centric, which is sustainable which is in a way which um, empowers populations rather than sort of which is almost a a top-down approach. And we can only do that if we try and ensure that the solutions for the problems originate from the region. And so this is where um, these discussions are super important, but we've got to try and figure out how do we ground the results with collaboration, cooperation, investment in the region. And going into COP27, um, it's going to be very clear that there's going to be a lot of countries in G77 plus who are upset because they're saying, but we, we, we're seeing these challenges on a daily basis. We have to, we have to deal with populations that do not have enough food who are being impacted by climate change. Help us deal with the loss and damage that's, that's been a result of, of centuries of exploitation. But anyway, I'll leave it there. That's more than my two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. No, thanks, Andrew, for this, um, yeah, very advocative um, response. And I would like to discuss later with all of you a little bit into how we can um, translate these different um, yeah, predictions and warnings, really, that we see into action. But before we do that, I would like to step, um, do one little um, step back and speak about early warning systems um, a little bit and ask Chris, who is developing early warning systems, um, that from your perspective, what information is needed to forecast weather and food security and also to then make sure that we translate this into action. Thank you very much, Sophie. Yeah, so I am a scientist who's worked for a long time developing early warning systems for sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, to do early warning systems for, for food security, you know, you begin with the recognition that, that food insecurity is incredibly complicated, right? And it involves, you know, on the, on the physical side, you know, all kinds of different stresses related with agricultural deficits, water deficits, um, climate extremes, 
And then, you know, on the human side, there's all kinds of factors related to prices, you know, incomes, poor access to, to water and, and food availability. Um, but because of really decades of work, you know, early warning systems in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel, you know, have kind of matched the complexity of that problem and developed, you know, really amazing systems that bring together experts across all of these different domains to, you know, monitor and, and identify the most food insecure people. And, you know, while the problems that we're facing are incredibly daunting, and I don't want to downplay that, you know, I do think that these uh, early warning systems are great examples of what we can do by acting together across, you know, multiple disciplines and agencies. And, you know, in a sense, they're working um, really well in the sense of, of safeguarding, pe preventing people from dying, um, which is not sufficient, but it is important to identify that, that we can, you know, work together to, to manage risk. Um, you know, so, so as context, in 2015, uh, there were about 35 million extremely hungry people identified by these, you know, food early warning systems. Um, and unfortunately, that's now increased to more than 100 million people, which is a huge epidemic of, of extreme hunger. So now, you know, basically one out of 80 people is in, in need of humanitarian relief, which is a huge and growing problem. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, mortality from famine is, has really dropped since like the 1980s. And so we are acting to, you know, safeguard lives. Um, but what we really need to do better is to, to safeguard livelihoods, you know, as Andrew says, and really step in and increase resilience, help get information down um, to the local scale so that people can adapt and manage risk. And, and hopefully later, Sophie, we can discuss that. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> Olo, maybe from your perspective, you're a WFP in the region um, and you're on the ground really addressing food insecurity. So we heard that there are well, early warning systems in place that are getting better and better, and you also work on that. But how, also from your perspective, can we ensure that the warnings are communicated um, in a timely and effective manner? Um, how can they reach actors? And then also, again, how can we um, make sure that these warnings really lead to action? You are saying, I have told you can hear me okay. And I just want to start with a few numbers. Uh, on the, in the Sorry, although we can't on. hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, like that, it's much better. Well, Okay, so I just want to start with a few numbers uh, on the G5 Sahel. Um, over 12 million people cannot feed themselves in the Sahel. 60% of those people are located in conflict affected areas. The vast majority of those areas are also prone to climate hazards. Uh, every two years, we have drought or prolonged dry spells in the Sahel. Every five, four or five years, we have severe droughts in the Sahel. So for us, having a functioning early warning system is a must in the Sahel. And those functioning early warning systems must play three functions. The first is collect, collect data, accurate data, timely data, have systems in place. And in this region, in the G5 Sahel countries, governments managed to establish what they call the SAP, and you translate in English, is early warning system across the five countries in the G5 Sahel. Those systems are there, they are functioning, depend on the country and the institutional position that they are. Uh, they lack or they suffer lack of resources, but they are there and institutions like WFP and others, we have been investing massively to make sure that those systems are working so that we have 
regular data collection. The second function is the analysis function. The analysis function is key because if we miss the analysis function, the interpretation of the data, then we miss the next step, which is the dissemination for decision making. And on the, on the analysis, uh, we manage as a region to put together what we call the card harmonize, which is, I will say, sometimes we say it's the equivalent of IPC. There are some nuances, but we do have a tool in this region to understand and to analyze data from different sources, put them together to understand the scale of the food and nutrition security and security situation in the region. This process is done twice a year, November and March, and it's involved multiple different stakeholders, different partners. And on the dissemination side, I think it's uh, there are two important things that we need to have in mind. The first, uh, data dissemination for decision making require that we have the right institutional anchor. And in this region, we have what we call SIDS, which is uh, a, a regional organization hosting the analytical process through the CAD harmonize. What we are trying to make sure is that the data is disseminating on time so that the decision makers have access to the data. We try to make sure that the decision makers understand the data because sometimes you know, there is a gap between the technical and the political. And it's important while setting up an early warning system to make sure that there is a strong connection between the technical and the political, between the, the technical and the decision makers. So what we have in this region, what we put through uh, the regional food and nutrition crisis prevention network is extremely a powerful tool for us to make sure that the early warning system is functioning and playing those three key functions that are needed to make sure that we have the information on time. I just want to start on two things very quickly. Uh, the quality of the data is important in the early warning system. And here in this region, there have been, a, 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 you know, there is a, a, a different actors pop populating data. Uh, the quality issues and is, is something that needs to be tackled because if you have bad data, then, you know, the rest is just going to mislead the, the decision. So we also invest a lot to make sure that the quality of the data uh, it's, it's good enough so that we can make accurate decisions based on using um, those, those data. Of course, technology today give us opportunities. We mentioned satellite imagery analysis as a tool, uh, phone based. So we have technologies now an opportunity to strengthen both the data collection and also um, the data dissemination um, uh, you know, functions within the early warning systems. And we can discuss further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Olu. Um, I think the yeah the quality of data that goes into um, the early warning systems, of course, directly impacts the quality of the warning, um, which I would like to come back to later because it's um, a bit of a yeah maybe maybe even an ethical issue that I would like to discuss later. But before that, um, I would like to ask Christoph um, a question that um, is also reflected in the chat by Alexandra Mesnil. Um, I mean, how do we ensure that these forecasts actually lead to actions at different levels? And how can we maybe also integrate early the issue of early or the tool as an early warning system into policy making? And Christoph, you're working on both early warning systems, but also long term climate change projections that are going way beyond an, an early warning system to into the um, like the next decades. So maybe if you could also um, from your experience, speak a little bit about how those different kinds of warning may differ in how they're being taken in by policymakers. Yeah, thanks, Sophie, for the question. I think that uh, yeah, all these points are very important, very relevant. Uh, let me start um, on the level how we how can we use these kind of early warnings and 
short-term forecasts for, for bringing this into action. And I think, as you pointed already out, we have quite different levels where we could focus on. And we see clearly that we also need all these different levels. So we have to make sure that in the end, in forecast and warning is, is reaching the farmers, because as these are the persons who are in place to act on their land to install irrigation systems to change uh, planting dates and to maneuver in the end to yeah cope with the risk of, of a longer or short-term drought of heavy precipitation events and this is the the basic level which we have to address but we also see of course we also have to find and develop the environment for the farmers to do so. And I think this requires action on a, on a broader level. And there are definitely national level, state governments, and also international action is needed to create these kind of environment for the farmers. And I think this refers a bit more to the process of disaster risk reduction, of installing insurance schemes in, in the country, right? Because this is nothing what a farmer could do for his or, his or her own, but this needs uh, the right environment. And I think that's that's very important to, to get all of these in place, all of the different levels, and yeah, to make sure that we have a warning which reaches in the end also the farmers and I just I mean we are today talking about the Sahel I would like to give two examples one from the Sahel and also one um, outside the Sahel region so if we look now in, in the region of Bangladesh we see a very well established early warning system where farmers if there is a warning are immediately act and search for shelters, for instance, if this is a typhoon warning. And there is a good placement that the, the warning also reaches the farmers. And I think right now, when we look at the Sahel, we have the floods, what Rahel has already introduced in her talk in, in chat. And there's a very poor communication from the National Weather Services, um, which reaches not all of the farmers are only a very few, if if any. And I think this makes it also so problematic because then the damages which the flood is causing are much more severe than in, in the other way around. And I think that's very important. And I think this is also what Olo has, has said. We This has something to do with how could we reach the farmers. This has something to do on how good are the predictive models? And this has something to do with um, how good is the data quality? Of course, if the data quality is poor, then we also have to ask ourselves, how much harm do we could do with a forecast? So if the forecast is not right, we could only do this once or maybe a second time, but then um, nobody would trust in these forecasts anymore. And I think this is also a very important question. And my last point, what you also said, Sophie, of course, this is not only the next drought or the next uh, flood event, which is in, in very short term, but we are also seeing with ongoing climate change, there are more and more of these events and we also have to prepare ourselves with adaptation to be better prepared to better cope with these kind of, of, of losses and damages. And here, yeah, as, as Andrew already pointed to, the entire debate of including loss and damages is, is so important. And we have to better understand on what actually is driven by climate change? What, what is the footprint of climate change and how will this change in, in the next decades? And I guess based on this, we have to also make sure that we have the right measures in place, not in 20 years, but we have to work now on these measures to have them in place in, in, in a few years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Mm, maybe directly coming in on your yours and also Olo's point on um, the quality of the data that goes into an early warning system or the quality of the warning. Um, I would like to ask um, Chris and Olo about the question, when are early warning systems good enough? So at what point do you send out a, a, a warning and what are the consequences and who bears the risk in case of an uh, inaccurate or wrong warning? 
Um, yeah, maybe Chris, you could start and then Olo, you could come in. Okay, yeah, I'll focus on, you know, the, the weather side of things because that's that's my expertise. And, you know, uh, there there is a, a period of a growing season where we have the most actionable information. And, you know, this is sort of like just before the growing season when, you know, typically you know, almost everywhere we have pretty good, you know, one to say 30 day weather forecasts. And then as we get into the season, we have, you know, really pretty good uh, satellite based rainfall estimates. And we have a capability to combine those two together. And, you know, this is part of what my group here at the Climate Hazard Center specializes in, in, in developing and in disseminating. And, you know, those can and are being used, you know, to trigger you know, kind of anticipatory action, you know, rapid um, uh, uh, sort of humanitarian responses. Like for example, um, this was just used in Niger to trigger a pretty large anticipatory action based on drought in, in June and July. Um, and uh, we're now looking tragically at a situation in Somalia where we're coming into a, the fifth failed growing season. And, and we can really rapidly identify that in the middle of the season. But in addition to that, um, the same information streams, you know, are being used by groups like Plant Village um, and to, in Burkina Faso to send agricultural advisories out to 12 million farmers about how to, to better, you know, grow their crops and increase their crop production. And so, you know, that's the real sweet spot in terms of early warning where um, even with existing technology, we have an incredible amount uh, of information that we can produce. And the exciting opportunity that we need to utilize better is the potential to take that information, you know, and for very little money, send it out to farmers so they can increase their, their you know, crop production and pastoral outcomes. And it's really quite inexpensive, you know, so for example, in Niger to send out an agro advisory to 12 million people costs Plant Village about 6,000 euros. And there's a, you know, it, it's hard to send food aid to somebody, it's very expensive, but disseminating information is relatively cheap, but, you know, it has to be passed on to, you know, local authorities who know how to interpret it and can share it with their constituents. And so it becomes a real question about organizing social capital in effective ways. Over. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Maybe over to, to you, Alain, on good security warnings. Yeah. I can agree in the, in the, in the, in the 17th and the 18th, when the big drought hit the Sahel, uh, almost 100, uh, let's say 100,000 uh, people died in the region. And one third of the livestock was destroyed. Uh, and from then, we all invested as an international community with the government support to build national early warning systems. We had drought, severe drought in 2011. We have severe drought in 2019, but no one died. No one died because the early warning system allowed to bring the humanitarian aid uh, before uh, the situation gets worse. So uh, I think getting right the information, providing the information on time, and having response systems organized to be able to, to, to deliver the humanitarian assistance on time is what we need. We need to make sure those systems are there and they are flexible. Listen, in the Sahel, I mentioned the Qadar Monizé, in October each year, November each year, sorry, we know more or less the scale of the food and nutrition and security in the region. The response starts in July which I think is quite late because we can start even earlier in March 
providing the humanitarian assistance in the Sahel. Nothing prevents us from doing it because we already know in November that the situation is going to be bad and we know the scale of the problem. Um, I also want to, to say that, you know, the different response systems that we have in the Sahel needs to also be uh, aligned with the early warning system. You know, the, the flexibility in using those response mechanisms is still, um, we still lack those flexibilities. And, and, and the, 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 in order to be effective, efficient, and make sure that we are not, uh, you know, we are using in the right way the information coming through the early warning systems and that the information trigger the right response, the response system needs also to be adapt, change, and, and move. I don't know if you are familiar to what we call the lean season response in the Sahel, where uh, every year from July to September, uh, the humanitarian actors respond with um, uh, humanitarian assistance during the lean season. And we have been doing that for, for decades in, in the Sahel which is good because we save lives, we protect people's livelihoods, we, but we need to be to go further beyond, right? We need to use systems that strengthen resilience so that communities themselves, as Chris said, communities themselves will be able to deal with those shocks because they have the information in advance, because they have been prepared through a more strong livelihood system, more strong um, uh, market system, to deal with the consequences of the drafts that are coming and that will come on their way in the, in the upcoming season. One important thing that we always uh, miss is that we need one single source of information for decision makers. If we have different source of information on the scale of the issue, we confuse decision makers, we delay the decision making time, and therefore it leads to a catastrophe that we don't want, want to see. So having one source of information is extremely important. The early warning system must be a coordination forum where we pull together different information, different actors, stakeholders, and discuss, agree, build a consensus, and use that consensus to make sure that the humanitarian and the resilience and others type of response are provided on time. Over. Yeah, thank you, um, Olo. Um, I would like to go a bit um, or add on this um, and ask Andrew um, about how we can better um, ensure cooperation, maybe also within the UN system. And this goes in line with the question that we received in the chat um, on how the study, uh, the one of the first questions he had on how the study deals with re um, regional prediction on cooperation. And um, the study that Rahel presented was an effort by UNHCR and UNIS to um, bring together all kinds of different um, institutes and experts in the UN system to um, yeah, sort of align the predictions for the Sahel and maybe Andrew, you could expand a little bit better about this effort and also maybe the lessons learned and what we see, how we can make sure that all these actors working in the Sahel for so many years also already can really pool their efforts and um, make sure that these predictions and then also the response is aligned. Yeah, um, no, no, thanks for that. And um, I think what what the report, like the best the best thing that came out of the report was the fact that people are able to and able and willing to work together um because what, what we tried to do was to initially i went and talked to all the un agencies in the sahel and i spoke to the regional bureaus i spoke to the country officers i spoke to the headquarters officers and even within the individual agencies everyone had a different idea about what their objective was in the sahel so it was all over the place and so so what we what we had to try and figure out is what was the overall objective of the UN in the Sahel? And you can also go to member states who have got something like 29 different strategies for the Sahel. So no wonder there's this huge sort of, um, I'd say mess, because everyone was working at um, almost, I don't want to say in competition, but that's what it almost seemed like. So getting a common sense of purpose was number one. What was the objective? What is the Sahel that people wish to um work towards or support 
And that has to be based on the ground level. You need to speak to the communities, you need to speak to the governments and see, okay, what is it that we're driving towards? And so it wasn't, I didn't want to have it as a UNHCR initiative. I wanted to have it as support to the five, particularly five central Sahelian states through the UN. And that's why the ownership came under UNIS, the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel. And so having that common umbrella was super important. So it wasn't a one agency or two agency or three agency. It was, let's see who is interested in the better Sahel and work towards that. And so what we did find was that a lot of the data, and I think this is super important and it's been raised before, was that a lot of the data that people had been making their um, their, their development programs, their, um, their, their anticipatory planning um, was either false, didn't exist, or people were not sharing it. Uh, and I think it's super important that you actually, when, when you go into data, you actually see, okay, is it actually, is it logical? Um, or is it basically a Potemkin village in order to justify years of mismanagement and, mis, and misprogramming? So it goes back to the issues of like, um, do we need to expand our partnership beyond our traditional set? And that's what, that's what we did. Uh, we found that it was almost, it was very difficult to get the data from the UN. It was much easier to work with PIC or FuseNet or Uppsala or these, or these other agencies who were really specialists in their field. And so to get an understanding of where the future of the Sahel lies, um, you need to expand it to include those people who've been working in these areas for years. But what we the, the next step that we don't have sorted out yet is building the capacity and and building that linkages with the regional and national entities, making sure it's not just a northern approach to addressing the situation of Sahel. So how do we build up the statistical capacity in Niger or in Mauritania or in in Burkina or how do we ensure that when the Ministry of Health um, provides reports, it's actually reflects what's actually going on the ground. And they're not just trying to, to um, respond to being able to justify the funds that have been provided. So it's no one has got the, um, let's say the monopoly on knowledge. And so this is where I think our project was so interesting because we had something like 20 different um, agencies, universities working together to almost to, to challenge each other. So very, like, PIC and, um, and Uppsala and, and FuseNet and um, Cassell and, and everyone, they, they quite rightly and sort of said, okay, well, is what your, how does your model work? And so this is what's important. Like it's rather than sort of, whenever anyone puts out a report and there's only one or two agencies involved in it, then it's, it's I don't want to say it's worthless, but there's a lot of challenges with it. You need to have this community of practice willing to do a peer review continuously because things change so much but it also has to be based and grounded on the situation on the ground you need to be able to talk to the communities and say well this is what the models are coming up with doesn't make sense because the situation um, is dynamic is context specific that's a, a long-winded answer to say there's, there's no choice but to collaborate at scale um, nationally uh, regionally and globally. Over. Christoph, did you raise your hand? Yeah, yeah. I, if I may. So yeah, thanks Andrew for, for mentioning this and I just wanted to second um, that I fully agree with what, what you have just said and maybe add a small piece of, of, of this debate. And I think I also saw a, a comment in the chat, somebody is asking, uh, we are we are talking a lot on data availability and data sharing and do we um, why do we, we doing this and do we actually have to act already right now and I fully agree of course there's no time to wait until we have the last piece of the data I think this is definitely clear it's just as a reaction of the comment on in the chat um, but we need both in the end we we also see that in some places, uh, I think I already said this, for instance, for many 
regions in, in the Sahel, we see that the number of weather stations is actually going down. So we had more stations in the past and having less right now. So, and this makes it even more difficult to make any useful prediction. At the same time, we are seeing that the staff who could act and deal with these and operate these with these stations are also going down government spending less and less money to train their staff. And we have to work with these uh, data sets, getting from less stations, from less educated staff, and should make better predictions in the, for, for future periods. So this is nothing what could work. And I think because of this, it's is so important that we work on um, capacity building, we work on data sharing, but at the same time, we don't have time to wait. We also have to work with with this, what we have already at place, make the best, best predictions out of this. Thank you, uh, Christoph. Olu, you wanted to comment on yeah, that? I don't know. You will have right now with data in the Sahel, it's not the lack of data. Data is there, it's spread. Uh, within different organizations, uh, national, uh, regional, uh, NGOs. We miss platforms where these data can be pulled together in a meaningful way for decision making. And this is why the report that Andrew, you, uh, you are mentioning is important that we have those kind of analysis done on a regular basis, continuous basis, in the Sahel, it gives us an opportunity to pull together all the data from different actors and analyze them in a meaningful way. That also raised the question of data management system. Has it UN in this region? Did we sit together to discuss how we can help countries and regional organizations in improving data management? Data management will include the storage, the quality review, the dissemination, everything around the management of the data that we have. And I think that should be the next step. We have been, I say we had WFP approach a few weeks ago by ECOWAS, for instance, and the request was to help develop what they call one-stop shop for the data that they have. So that in that one-stop shop, you can have access to a repository of data that exists in the region. And I think as an organization has a UN system in the region, this is the way forward, but it has to be a collective effort because one organization cannot achieve this. Over. Thanks, Olo. Um, uh, yeah, Chris, please come in and then Babur. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just, you know, quickly, give a, a, a shout out for the, the meteorological and hydrological institutions in the Sahel and you know, the vital role that, that they're playing. Um, but you know, as Christoph points out, you know, the amount of available you know, gauge observations, rain gauge observations, air temperature observations you know, is really low and is really decreasing. And you know, it, it used to be that the SILS countries you know, received kind of routine funding to support their meteorological agencies. And, and that was really quite successful for, for decades, but that has stopped now. And so we have this situation where, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, euros of uh, humanitarian assistance is flowing into the region. But, you know, some of the most important agencies and institutions at the national and regional level, you know, are incredibly underfunded. And so, uh, that just seems, you know, a big mismatch to me. And, you know, hopefully we can work to reinforce those institutions over. Thank you, Chris. Babora, um, over to you. Thanks. Uh, I had a very brief question on Allah, um, because you mentioned that um, we need good data or we speak about uh, needing good, good data, but um, not always the data is available or it's available in a sufficient quality and you mentioned this as well and I wonder from an eth ethical perspective whether then it is better um, rather 
um, not to do any predictions at all if we know that the information or to still use it. So I just, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I can start with the example of Mauritania because I was there last week. I've been traveling a lot in the region and today I'm in Lomi, but last week I was in Mauritania and my, the purpose of my mission was to help review uh, the market information infrastructure of the country. And when I got there, uh, I realized that there were, um, I'm not joking, but there were 25 organizations in Mauritania, uh, a country of 4 million people involved in price data collection. And each of them were using different methodology, different approach. Uh, they were not talking to each other. It was not just impossible, it was just impossible to understand the market situation of the country, even putting together those different information from different source, different methodology. So harmonization is key. As long as we can work on processes to harmonize the quality, the data that we have, we can use them for prediction. We can use them for further analysis to better understand the situation of the region. So harmonization is key. Christoph mentioned something that I think is extremely important, the capacity that countries have in collecting and processing data. It's meteorological data, it's uh, market data, it's everything around food security. Uh, we do need that level of investment to keep those systems up and running to be able to help on the analytical front. So harmonization, make sure that we build enough capacity in the countries so that the data that is there can be used for prediction. But I don't think it posed any issue with moral issue, let's say that, okay, at this stage, as long as we can work on the harmonization and improve the quality of the data. Over. Thanks, Alu. Um, Barbara, I would like to come a little bit back to this question of linking early warning system to human security and migration. And um, even with, I mean, there are efforts in place of um, setting up early warning systems for human security or migration or even longer term predictions. So maybe um, from your experience, could you give a little bit of a background on that? And then what I think would be a really interesting um, question to discuss a little bit is, is it actually ethical to predict security and migration? Why do we do that? And what are um, yeah, potential issues with it as well? Yeah, thanks, Sophie, for the question. So, yeah, I think um, there are several um, efforts to um, you know, um, conduct uh, future projections or predictions of future numbers of uh, migrants in the context of climate change. And uh, one of the most uh, prominent and well-known ones is the World Bank um, uh, Groundswell Report. And um, uh, I think uh, um, all of these efforts are certainly very useful uh, for policymaking. Um, uh, the question is, uh, um, you were asking about uh, the ethical aspect. So the question is, um, I think per se, um, the projections are not so controversial, but the question is how they are used. So every piece of information can be used, uh, you know, productively or misused, and then can be used to better prepare for future inflows of migrants to, to better prepare um, so that there is no competition uh, for jobs or for housing um, in the in the receiving areas. So this, this can be always uh, how pro, uh, policymakers can uh, productively engage with, with uh, predictions. But then of course, um, if the predictions um, uh, and projections um, are used, uh, for anti-immigratory policies, then it, it becomes critical. So in the end, um, the moral responsibility of uh, climate migration projections uh, is, or predictions, sorry, is um, lies in the hands of um, decision makers. Um, then, then the other aspect is um, how reliable are these predictions because climate migration is um, driven by, by multiple factors. Um, including socioeconomic factors such as income or dependence on agriculture, but also political factors. And um, predicting all of this 
um, and deriving the, the single uh, client into migration flows is extremely difficult. And um, I think boiling everything down to one number uh, maybe maybe doesn't make, make so much sense, but um, what I think um, would be a plausible workaround in this context, uh, context is thinking in terms of scenarios, like what happens if this happens, or uh, thinking in, um, you know, confidence intervals and ranges. Um, uh, so um, something like this could be, uh, you know, a way how policymaker can prepare on different range, uh, different possible futures. Um, you know, independently of what happens, they know, okay, this is the, the lower range, this is the upper range. If we implement these policies, uh, we would be happy with the outcome, whatever happens. So th th this would be a great uh, way to operate in this uh, in this context. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. And um, we're almost um, heading into the Q&A section. I would just um, like to ask Christoph to give maybe um some sort of outlook um, or um, yeah, a bit of an overview on the role of early warning systems or yeah, for climate change adaptation and also the role of climate change adaptation, more longer term adaptation and resilience building for human security and migration in the Sahel. So we have a bit of a roundup um, now and then I will go into the questions of the audience. Yeah, I think we are already deep in, in the questions, but um, to to yeah, focus or to refer to your question, I think we have talked a lot on, on early warning systems and what is needed to, to bring them in place. And I think that's very important, but I think to yeah, go one step back and focus on the overall picture, this is something what falls under the disaster risk reduction and of course, this is a very important pillar, but I think we also have to focus on how could we avoid these having losses and damages where we have to react to. And I guess here adaptation comes into play. So we see already the, the impacts of climate change and we also ha had in the past negative effects of weather shocks. And we have to ask ourselves, so how could we, deal with these in a better way? How could we adapt and how could we make the society more resilient and yeah, to better cope with these kind of risks? And I think the first step should not be to bring an in insurance or some kind of early warning or disaster risk reduction mechanism in place. I think this is, um, we first of all have to focus on making the society more resilient to, to these kind of shocks, to avoid that these shocks causes losses and damages. And, and then we, of course, also need to, for a certain degree, disaster risk reduction measures. But if we only focus on them, the price will be very high. So reducing the risk beforehand is always cheaper than acting to the risk. And I think this is very important. And of course, there will be a certain risk left. And therefore, we need these early warning systems. We need insurances. And we will also face situation in many countries, and in particular also in the Sahel, where we will see that neither adaptation nor disaster risk reduction will solve the problem. And we will end up with losses and damages here. And I think we also have to be prepared for this and also have to answer the questions, who is paying the bill on for this? So I think without giving an answer, but I think this is an important question. Yeah, thank you. Um, great to end it on that question. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, you're right. We're actually already uh, deep into um, the also the questions that have been asked in the chat function. And I would like to thank the audience for your very active participation in this. Um, and of course, also for the good answer so far. Um, but we'll go on now. And um, I would like to give the floor to um, Rim Rimnoma. Sorry, I hope I'm um, spelling your correct um, the name correctly. I will now unmute you and please feel free to ask your question. Yes, hi, thank you everyone. It's just to add to the discussion uh, on early warning systems. We found that it was really uh, interesting because the information is there, 
but how you get it to the farmers or the extension officer concerning our weather data. So it was really important how we can use this information and diffuse it to many people. Like in Kenya, we use a SMS system and TV, but in the Sahel where we don't have a, a lot of SMS platform where we can use, a, for now we use a lot of TVs and radios where we can broadcast the information every week. But if you send the information only without uh, telling, talking about something that interested the farmer, like uh, agricultural knowledge, uh, how to raise your cow and so on, and finish by that. And also try to extrapolate, like if you say you're going to have uh, five millimeters of rain, okay, how the farmers understand five millimeters. So we found out to a way where we can calculate the amount of this rain per hectare. So the farmers have better understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about five millimeters of rain. And when we have drought period, how we can uh, solve the drought period, like we're going to have two weeks without rain. Okay, we won't have, we will have two weeks without rain, but what should I do? So, and farmers coming with some kind of uh, innovations, some people even put water in the uh, pesticide tanks and try to apply it to the uh, plants at very localized way. So that's a way that they can cope to this drought period. So this information is really interesting, but the last mile, last mile delivery, I think that's where we need to think more and come with some innovation, how we can make the information available to the farmers. We at Plant Village, like Chris Funk was talking, we have youth team on the ground and they are permanently in contact with the farmers, like five days a week. So if they have some maps, they can easily talk with the farmer when they interact directly with them and explain them what the map really means. So, because for now, uh, researchers will have some good understanding when we have a, a weather map, but that's not the case with farmers. So I think we need to focus more and come with some different innovation, how we can make the information available. And we're working on the platform also for production where we can follow the farm from this uh, soil preparation up to the harvest. And I think this can be also useful for predicting in the different location, if we have the information on the farm and the harvest of maybe some numbers of farm per location, that can give an idea of the health warning system, how the, the season will, uh, will be with the different harvests we're going to have. So work on that way to make the system uh, better. But we really need it, but the last mile is where I think we need to think more and come with different innovations. Yeah, thank you very much for your insights. Um, Olo, I'm handing over to you. Yeah, I wanted just to uh, uh, Mr. Vidraugo just said, and and I think the 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 key question, Mr. Vidraugo, is to understand that we need to find a way, of course, to come up with innovative uh, solution to disseminate the information to. Uh, the hand in the hands of the last mile users. Uh, and we need to make sure that those solutions are sustainable. And to be sustainable, we need to see countries where we are operating, what are the quality of the extension services that are out there. Those are key to make sure that the information, the good practice, whatever, whatever we do and provide as information can be a effectively used by the hand, those um, hand users of the information. So the dissemination is one thing and finding this innovative solutions to get the information in the hands of the end user is one thing. The ability of those users to use effectively the information and in fact, Deborah, you mentioned it with prediction is also one thing. And I think we need to have a broad thinking on and, and come up with a broad strategy because there are different pieces, right, uh, uh, out there. Over. Yeah, thank you. And um, I would like to pick up on another question we've received in the chat by uh, Anne Moisin, um, who asks whether donor investments or aid should be more, uh, more closely tied um, or conditional to local level improvements. Um, such as communication to farmers or insurance programs, rather than leaving this to top-down state initiatives. So, also, 
um, would, who would like to answer to this? Maybe anyone else is on I'll, I'll, I'll step forward. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes, Sophie. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, um, as an early warning system developer, you know, I, we've seen these incredible advances in our early warning capacities, right? Our ability to monitor the climate and the weather and do weather and climate predictions. But, you know, unfortunately, for the most part, in terms of if you follow the money, right? I mean, most of that information is used to um, trigger really expensive retroactive food security responses. And I think, you know, we need a much more information, you know, flowing early to the local level to support adaptation in, in many ways. And, you know, it, I think that that, I mean, there's plenty of studies that have shown that that kind of activity, you know, is, is far more effective financially. Uh, so it's less expensive, you know, it, it builds resilience, um, it is much more dignified, you know, and socially non-disruptive. So I think that is where the future lies. Over. Yes, Andrew. Um, you know, I wanted Chris to to um to go first because he's like it's a whole issue of famine early warning system. So he's it's key. Like what we've been also looking at a lot is um we know how difficult it's going to be. Like there's a lot of givens, there's a lot of data out there which can tell us that situation is going to get worse. So what do we need to be doing about it? And we're obviously talking a lot about um, national ownership, community-based approaches. So what I think we need to ensure is that um, national adaptation plans or nationally determined contribution plans, they are fit for purpose because if you actually we, we need to ensure that the interventions or the support that donors contribute are actually part of a holistic approach, community-based but nationally owned. And the um, these national adaptation plans, a lot of them may be dating back to like 19, sorry, 2016 to 2018, and they're they're often just a um, a wish list which have no sort of real sort of holistic approach. I think what the international community could really do a lot better at is linking in not only the early warning, but support to adaptation. Because when you talk to governments, they say there's no money. When you talk to the uh, international financial institutions, they say there's no bankable or investment projects in these countries that we can support. So I think what the UN could do, which would be actually quite useful, <laughs> is actually to um, support the the national governments listen to the communities come up with a pipeline of investable projects which lead to more resilient communities uh, support adaptation preparedness early warning systems in a much more holistic manner and so like what what would be good is that for instance the Berl berlin climate security conference has a stock take of where we are now and then sort of say the next conference let's see whether we've got 20 decent national adaptation plans and present those to the various banks or foundations who keep going out and promising stuff, but we just don't see any delivery because their comeback is there's nothing which is bankable or realistic to be implemented. So otherwise we're all just chasing our tails and, and having more conferences on about how many more people are suffering. So we need to really find out what is this disconnect between the needs and the funding. And so when we do talk about loss and damage, we can actually quantify, not just whinging and complaining about the situation, we can say, this is a pipeline of a bankable, investable projects, and but also hold the governments and communities accountable as well for implementing, because this money is not going to be for free. Every um, every bank or foundation that I've spoken to, they've got hard conditions. They do not want to invest in high risk areas. So we have to say, you have to uh, be much more human centric in your approach and not just invest in plantations in Northern Europe or in Canada. 
Like so, we, we've we've all got a um, responsibility here that we don't look at um, the situation just based on food insecurity or climate change. It is about how do we take the evidence, how do we take the trends, how do we take the data, um, and make a difference on the ground to support the adaptation of these communities. Over. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're actually already um, heading <laughs> with great speed towards the end of the session, which is very unfortunate because there are so many um, great inputs from everyone. Um, maybe we could just have a final, I would just like one final point that came up by um, two questions in the chat that I would like to um, maybe address to Christoph um, of how we can ensure that local knowledge and not um, not only national local knowledge, but really local knowledge from farmers, for example, could be integrated into um, warnings and also action. Very short answer. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's that's very important to yeah, B, uh, have a tailor-made approach in the end, which which also includes the knowledge which comes from farmers, because I think it's really hard to make these uh, changes suggested from, let's say, say somewhere in the West or in the North, um, cultural changes and also changes of agricultural practices are really hard to, yeah, to implement if they are not um, driven by the owners and not driven by the community. And I think this is very important to integrate this and to, yeah, also, but not just take them only, but also integrate new, new aspects of uh, a changing environment and changing climate situation. And I think if we ensure this, and if we integrate a local ownership in addition to new scientific knowledge, and I think we have the chance to create a better and more resilient agriculture system, which could cope with the existing risk and also with new risks in, in this manner. Super, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you everyone for your participation and really this very, very lively discussion. Also a huge thanks to the audience who uh, posed such great questions, but really uh, the panelists, thank you for your expertise. Um, I would already like to wrap up and um, we've had a really rich discussion about um, the need mainly the need of harmonizing early warning systems of really pulling together there's so much expertise out there and really making sure that we translate um, the warnings into action and I think one point that I would like to finish uh, on here is the need to think long term and the need to think in a holistic way of the interlinked challenges um, in linking early warning systems to long-term climate change adaptation and the need to just take the damage and loss that um, is left over basically from this into consideration. Um, thank you everyone for attending. The session is recorded and will be available on YouTube. And um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch um, if you have any other questions and I wish you a nice afternoon and good luck with all of your great endeavors um, in on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, bye.